NVIDIA is making a Chinese Blackwell. Wiz says no to Google. AMD acquires Silo. AI mainframes from BMC. Swiss are opening up the government. Chatbot Einsteins. And a closer look at that whole CrowdStrike kerfuffle this week on The Rundown. Hello, everyone. It's Tom Hollingsworth. It's The Rundown. It's Wednesday, July the 24th. And I got a joke for you. Dog walks into a bar and says, I cannot see a thing. I'll open this one. And if you didn't get that, it's because it's one of the oldest jokes ever written from Sumeria. Because it's National Tell an Old Joke Day. Trust me, you didn't want me to tell the other ones because the oldest joke in the world is a fart joke. But no joke, Stephen Foss gets back with me this week. Stephen, welcome back to the show. I will tell you the most popular joke in French in France after this. Um, it takes a little while to laugh, though. Well, thankfully, it won't take us a little while to get through the news because we've had a lot of things going on over the last week or so. Um, you know the big one. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but we wanted to start off by telling you about NVIDIA because NVIDIA is working on yet another AI chip. This one's targeted at the Chinese market. This new B20 is a variation on the B200 Blackwell series that is their latest one out. It is designed to be compatible with export restrictions for China. NVIDIA is reportedly working with a partner in Spur to have these chips ready to go by Q2 of 2025. The B20 would be the fourth in a line of chips that have been released since 2023 when the export restrictions went into place for the Chinese market. Steven, you're very big on all the things coming out of NVIDIA. What does a Chinese-specific chip mean for this market? Well, this would not be the first Chinese-specific chip from NVIDIA. Um, the company, um, assuming, let's let's assume goodwill from uh, NVIDIA. They're a good corporate uh, partner, uh, part of the U.S., uh, you know, a, a, good, a, a good player in the industry. And they've attempted to abide by export restrictions while still selling their products in China. So over the years, I think that they've created now, uh, this would be their fourth or third um, special China market version of their uh, uh, land or, uh, flagship uh, GPUs for uh, AI compute. Uh, most of these have, have similarly been um, a two-digit number instead of a three-digit number. So the B200 becomes the B20. Uh, generally speaking, what the, the, the US uh, limits on shipping chips to China uh, focus on what they call um, the total processing power of the chip. And the TPP is um, kind of multimodal, but essentially it boils down to a number of uh, teraflops of, uh, of performance at a given precision. Uh, the current uh, Blackwell chip is far too fast for that limit. Uh, in fact, it's somewhere between seven and eight times faster than the U.S.-China uh, export limit. So if we are going to extrapolate here, um, the, uh, the B20 would be basically uh, probably an eighth as fast as the B200. Now, what are they going to do? Are they going to slow it down? Um, I, I think not. I think what they would do is trim it down. And so what the Chinese market would get would be a small inexpensive and low power consuming processor that can be used with all of the existing uh, NVIDIA CUDA language and models and so on. That's what they've done in the past. And it's actually uh, af after a bit of a slow start uh, with the previous generation ch China market specific chip, it's, it's, it's really taken off for NVIDIA. And I suspect that this one will too, because this will be a very, very compelling chip. It will offer a great deal of performance in a very low power envelope. It'll be very, very cost competitive, probably half the cost of the current uh, China market NVIDIA chip. And it will be pretty attractive, I think, to uh, AI in China. So uh, again, we, we have to emphasize the fact that this has not officially been announced. We don't actually know anything or even if the B20 will exist, but assuming it does, and I think that's a safe assumption, that's kind of what we're looking at here. And I think that it'll be a big success for NVIDIA. I think the only real challenge for NVIDIA in this is that the US government might say, well, you know what? <laughs> Since these chips can all be partnered and, and paired together and clustered, 
uh, it really doesn't matter to limit the total processing power on a per chip basis. Let's limit it in some other way that would be more restrictive. I would not be at all surprised if the U.S. government under either a future Trump administration or a future Harris administration decided to um, restrict the export of technology to China in some other way. And that would basically take this whole thing off the market. So if I was uh, Jensen Wang, uh, I would probably be working on a B20 and I would probably be working on plan B in case the uh, whole picture changes and you can't export a B20 to China. Last week, uh, we took a closer look at Google's proposed acquisition of Wiz. Uh, apparently both sides did uh, as well because the reports this week are that the acquisition has been called off. Wiz co-founder Asaf Rappaport said that it was hard to walk away from a proposed $23 billion deal, but he's focused on getting the company to a billion dollars in annual recurring revenue, and he's looking at doing an IPO that would probably raise even more money. No official word on why the talk stalled, but reports state that uh, pending antitrust litigation from the DOJ here in the U.S. could have uh, impacted the acquisition. What's your take, Tom? Man, do you remember last week when uh, I talked about how this would be a great deal and, and Google really needed to go after it? Yeah, this is one of the reasons why reporting on rumors is such a hard thing, because you never know what's going to happen. Well, in this case, we know exactly what's going to happen is that Wiz decided that they could probably make more money in an IPO than they could selling out to Google. Now, I'm not going to be the first person to tell you this was a good idea or a bad idea because there's a lot of mechanics that go in that. For every Cisco in Meraki, you get a company that gets acquired and their brand just completely disappears into thin air and you never even know what happened to them. So I think that ultimately what happened is that Wiz took a long look at this and said, we would probably be better off if we were independent. Sure, we're not going to make the upfront money, but the time of Wiz being out there and being one of the most present security companies that there is, in addition to being able to work on Microsoft Azure or AWS, gives them a, a higher ceiling, if you will. Um, I won't say that the DOJ's antitrust litigation had a part in this, but I'll also tell you that sometimes you can get a good sense for things, even if they're not official, by making a few phone calls, talking to a few friends, and if, uh, hold on, Magic 8-Ball, signs point to no. That may be a good way to kind of say, you shouldn't pursue this acquisition because if you do, we're going to probably shoot it down. One of the things that we've seen from the current U.S. administration is they are very focused on putting these mega acquisitions through the ringer. There's a lot of questions that come up. I mean, Activision Blizzard took years to pull off and almost didn't on a couple of occasions. And we've seen some other high profile mergers fall apart. I think the biggest one, you know, would be NVIDIA and ARM. And that wasn't even the US that, that caused that one to go. I mean, any one of a number of regulatory bodies all over the world can uh, basically torpedo any kind of acquisition. So I think, you know, it was the combination of rough seas ahead kind of unofficially, but also Wiz turning around and going, well, if everybody thinks that this is such a good deal for us, because, you know, we have so much value to bring to the market, why don't we just bring the value to the market ourselves? So I'm, I'm hopeful that this works out in the favor of all companies involved. Obviously, as it is, you know, I'm, I'm just going to guess here. I'm sure Wiz's stock price went up a little bit. I'm sure Google's stock price went down a little bit. They'll even themselves out uh, in just a little bit, even though I'm not a financial analyst and you definitely shouldn't listen to anything I say about that. I think overall, when Wiz's stock price gets to IPO levels, that's when we're probably going to see it take off like a rocket. And then the investors are going to be very happy that this thing kind of went the way that it did. AMD is betting big on AI with an acquisition. The chip maker is paying $665 million to purchase Finnish AI startup Silo AI. This company specializes in custom AI models and platforms aimed at enterprise customers. The aim is to have a ready-made group that can build custom AI models to run on AMD hardware as an attractive alternative to NVIDIA's do dominance in the market. Silo AI is also committed to making those models open source and freely available as opposed to a closed model from a company like OpenAI. Stephen, 
What do you think about this? Is picking up a new AI model startup going to help AMD kind of launch into the market and compete with the big players? Yeah, I think this is a great move. Let me just say, uh, you know, big pat on the back for AMD here. They picked a great choice. Um, it is everything they needed in the AI market and more. And uh, even though this is, in fact, the biggest uh, AI acquisition uh, ever, I guess, uh, or the biggest, at least in Europe, um, since Google bought DeepMind uh, about 10 years ago, um, this is probably going to be worth the money to AMD. Uh, essentially, the reason that uh, one of the reasons that NVIDIA has been so successful, apart from the fact that they make really good products and they've got, uh, you know, leading edge uh, technology, is that the, on the software side, so much of the uh, AI software that's been developed is focused on AMD, or I'm sorry, on NVIDIA's uh, CUDA technology, as well as their overall um, infrastructure stack. In other words, uh, they're the x86 of AI, and everybody is uh, developing toward that standard stack of hardware and interfaces. And that makes it really hard for competitors to come in because competitors can't really create compatible uh, hardware because they don't have CUDA. And um, so many of the models are just designed and developed to work there. That's what Silo AI was uh, working on, was basically creating uh, an entire AI stack that would run not just on uh, CUDA, but also on uh, other platforms, including AMDs. This is a pretty impressive group. Um, I don't know too much about them specifically, but if you read their uh, self uh, descriptions, they have 300 PhDs and researchers working on software. It's Europe's largest uh, AI lab. And AMD is picking up all of that. Now, the important thing here, as I said, is that this would essentially make it very, very easy for people to develop uh, AI models that run, uh, that can be trained, or that can run inferencing tasks on uh, AMD's uh, MI250 and MI300 uh, GPU processors. This, in turn, would hopefully spark uh, greater success for that processor range. AMD is absolutely competitive in, uh, with uh, NVIDIA in terms of, of hardware. Now, there are definitely uh, shortcomings to the AMD hardware, just like there are to the NVIDIA, to Intel and Qualcomm and all the rest. But uh, AMD's uh, MI250 and MI300X are really, really strong products. But they've seen very, very little uptake, uh, not a lot of customer uh, use uh, really a drop in the bucket compared to the numbers of GPUs that uh, NVIDIA is selling into the AI data center. And it all comes down to software. That's what this is all about. It's about opening that door and making it easier for, uh, especially for enterprise customers to buy an AMD hardware stack instead of an NVIDIA based hardware stack and deploy their AI models there. I absolutely think that that's what's gonna happen here. I definitely think that Silo AI which again is developing this software interface, but also developing a lot more. As you mentioned, they have their own models. They've got a whole easy to use uh, AI platform that customers can uh, deploy. I think that's really gonna have the uh, intended effect in terms of goosing the sale of AMD's GPUs. And I think that in short order, I mean, really a short amount of time, AMD will easily recover their $665 million that they're putting into this uh, by selling literally billions of dollars of uh, GPU processors. So great move, a big pat on the back for AMD. And I definitely think that this is going to change the market. BMC is adding AI to their automated mainframe intelligence platform. That's right, AI on the mainframe. This is a strategic move designed to enhance mainframe software development and simplify operations. It means better documentation, the ability to simplify complex code analysis, and more. You may think that mainframes are dated technology, but as we've seen uh, recently, so much of our everyday lives are run on mainframes, and, and that's really a good thing because uh, it, it protects us from some of the challenges, let's say, that open systems can have uh, due to things like uh, malware and uh, cyber attacks. 
The real expert in this area is uh, my colleague, uh, Futurum Group, Stephen Dickens. So I want to turn this over to Stephen and see what he has to say about BMC's AI in their automated mainframe intelligence. Well, too kind as always, Steve. Um, I don't know whether I'm the expert, but and I, I wouldn't agree with the setup of outdated technology as anybody knows me, but diving straight in here. First thing to say, this is the first statement of direction that BMC have done. So normally their mode is to do GA announcements, which they do on a quarterly basis typically. So I think being off cycle and being a strategic sort of announcement that this is going to be coming later on in the year um, is, is the first point of note. So why are they doing that? I think it's crucial that they are seen to continue to innovate and be seen to be bringing this value. They're probably getting asked questions by their clients. What are you doing? So so that's the first piece. Then to drill down, I think there's kind of two lenses to this for me. There's the operational piece. You talked about documentation. You know, these are long-standing platforms. There's a lot of material that BMC and others have curated for how to use and administer these platforms. So I think the first piece is, this is a way to democratize that knowledge and make it easier for newer, less skilled um, system programmers and system administrators to get up to speed. That's good. We're starting to see the demographics change from mainframe system programmers. So I think this is good from that lens. The other piece is from a code assistant point of view. BMC does a great job with its DevX platform, probably market leading I'm going to annoy a couple of people out there who's, when I say that, but they're doing a really good job with their developer experience. So the ability to be able to interpret code, understand code, again, democratizing some of that for particular COBOL developers and PL1 developers and some of the other mainframe code languages, super crucial. So I think good statement of direction from BMC, expecting more to drop later on in the year as they get closer to GA. I could probably guess when it's going to be. They've got a big event coming this fall. They've not told me that, but it wouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there's going to be something around their Connect event. So I think I'd be looking out for that. But lots coming, really good to see. Need to see some demos. Probably going to see those in a couple of weeks' time to really get some detail. But really impressed with what BMC are doing. John McKenney, as a GM of this business, is doing a great job. I spent some time with him a few months back understanding this strategy. Team's on the right path. Good to see them being bold and being declarative about their strategic direction and looking forward to when the product drops later on in the year. Well, thanks a lot, Stephen. It's really great to have you joining us here on The Rundown. Salesforce announced the Einstein Service Agent this week. It's an autonomous AI that's working to improve chatbots by increasing the range of tasks that can be done automatically by software without the input of humans. When Einstein encounters a problem that it can't handle, it is smart enough to seamlessly hand the issue off to a waiting human to make sure that the issue is resolved properly. The service has been introduced in the pilot phase with a target release for later this year. Salesforce is one of the biggest applications in the world, and it is used daily by thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of users. So the ability to cut down on support requirements, both on the Salesforce side, as well as for the people who have deployed it, would be a huge change in the way that we do things. Stephen, how is AI going to help us when it comes to improving the chatbot interface? Well, this is a really interesting one because uh, as many of us are somewhat aware, uh, much of what the uh, enterprise workforce uses on a day-to-day -day basis is built on the Salesforce platform. Salesforce has become incredibly important as a business intelligence and business process platform uh, across the enterprise. It, it doesn't you know, Salesforce is a platform, though. It doesn't actually do things on its own. It's intended to be a uh, SaaS platform that you can build your own applications on top of. And it's incredibly powerful when you have uh, built an application there. The problem is that um, much of that uh, development is pretty challenging and uh, high paid and, and, and expensive and, and difficult work for 
enterprise customers. And so I think the fact that Salesforce is going to be adding a new tool to the toolbox, uh, an AI chatbot, is probably a pretty good news for Salesforce customers. Essentially, this is not another um, uh, turnkey product. This is really a core uh, platform component that includes much of the AI that you might want in enterprise applications, including a large language model that can be used as a interactive chatbot. But also, you know, you can use this large language model to interact with the data within the platform. You can have it um, look up information within Salesforce um, using uh, retrieval augmented generation or RAG. You can uh, have it do things uh, like masking PII. You can set guardrails um, and boundaries and permissions for the uh, Einstein chatbot to uh, adhere to so that it can only look in certain areas of Salesforce. And it can be used in a number of different ways. Um, they are uh, talking about having it uh, be used in uh, chat platforms like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, SMS. But also, of course, you can deploy it in custom applications. It really is a, a major new capability for Salesforce customers and Salesforce software developers. And the thing that I like the best about it is that it is designed in such a way that it would appeal to those core customers. In other words, this is not something where Salesforce is coming in sort of um, haphazard with a new tool and, and they're gonna you know, transform the way you use Salesforce. No, this is Salesforce coming to the customers that they know extremely well and saying, okay, we've seen what you're trying to do. We know how you use Salesforce as a platform. And here's a combination of AI technology that you can integrate into those applications in a, in a logical way, in a way that delivers value according to how you're currently using Salesforce. So to me, applications of AI like this are extremely smart and really are leading the way toward this um, AI-assisted future, not sort of AI replacing everything. Switzerland has decided that open source matters so much so that they've enacted a federal law on the use of electronic means for the fulfillment of government tasks, which is a very Swiss legal name, uh, which is a long way of saying that they're gonna require the use of open source software in the public sector. All code must be disclosed unless third party rights or security concerns force it to be restricted. The aim is to show the public uh, that their money is uh, paying for uh, proven and uh, open source technology and uh, the act also requires that non-personal and non-classified data has to be released as open as well, uh, according to a principle that they're calling open by default. Now, here we have an example of Switzerland really leading the way in terms of software and data openness. What's your take, Tom? I think this is Switzerland putting their francs where their mouth is. This is a huge step forward in the idea behind what open source is supposed to represent. Now, I know that you're going to have a bunch of people out there, you know, the, the Stallmans of the world that software needs to be free and more power to, to them and, and their beliefs. But here you've got a government, a, a recognized entity saying the public is paying for this. The public has every right to see what they're paying for. And anyone who lives in the U.S., that that kind of feels like almost like they're in, antithetical to each other. The government does government stuff and we don't know what the government's doing. Well, Switzerland's turning around and going, would you like to see our code? Here it is. We, we're going to publish all of this information unless it is personal or it is secured for some reason, like defense industry information. And I think that that is a radical step forward for a government to take. I think it's an important one, though not just because they're making the code available for viewing, because that is a trap that a lot of companies will fall into. I will make this available if you want to see it with an asterisk. And then that is, you must request it, you must be vetted, it must do this, you must do that. And then like four months later, you've forgotten that you've requested it at all, right? Just look up any kind of Freedom of Information Act request that journalists make of the US government and see how long it takes for them to get done. Here, the Swiss are like, we're publishing it. And you here's where you can go to see it, but it is out there. It is going to be available for people to look at. 
not only does this set a new bar for transparency, it also effectively forces other governments of the same type to make that same leap forward. We're putting this out here because we want to be open and transparent by default. In their defense, Switzerland is notoriously neutral in everything. So they don't necessarily have people allied against them. So I can see how this could be an easy move for them to make. You know, I I can just now hear, you know, the Chinese government, for example, going, well, we can't leave this open for, uh, you know, anybody to find because, you know, the Western imperialist powers fill in the blank here. Whatever they're going to do, they're going to do with it. But I like where they're going with this. And it should drive more people to want to adopt open source software. More importantly, it's going to drive people to want to develop open source software, which is a problem that we've seen over the last couple of years, is that a lot of open source projects are starting to kind of wither on the vine. And that's due to people not wanting to contribute anymore because they're not seeing the returns on it that they might want to get. Whereas here... If you're going to write software for the Swiss government, it has to be open source. So maybe people are going to get in with those smaller projects, cut their teeth on that development environment, and then parlay that into more, if you want to call it lucrative, whether it's time or skills or whatever, being able to provide that to the Swiss government. And note that it's open source. Doesn't mean it's free. So that's, you know, we're back to the whole free is in freedom, free is in beer thing. I am sure the Swiss government is still going to be paying a reasonable amount of money for this code, it just means that the code is going to be available for people to look at to make sure that the juice is worth the squeeze, as it were. Um, of course, it's protecting third party investments and things like that. So, you know, I don't know if there's still an NVIDIA binary driver for the graphics card in the kernel, it's that's not going to be available as source code, but everything else should be open. And bravo to the Swiss for making this happen. Thumbs up from me. Well, it's time to take a closer look at uh, something that happened in the news this past Friday. I'm sure you know what it was because there was a big outage. No, I'm not talking about the one from Azure. I'm talking about a misconfigured update to a popular security platform known as CrowdStrike that managed to take down over 8 million Windows PCs and servers. The issue caused the target system to halt and then refuse to boot. Affected entities included multiple airlines, healthcare systems, and the Starbucks Order Ahead app, which personally impacted my family. Fixes were developed and put into play, but initially they required a reboot into safe mode or mounting an image on a new system to remove the offending file, which pretty much ground AWS to a halt over the weekend as people tried to get their servers back online. CrowdStrike CEO released a statement that was not well received, and that could have something to do with the fact that back when he was the CTO at McAfee, back in oh, about 2010, the same thing happened to McAfee. Now, remember that this affected Windows PCs, right? So what was Microsoft's take on this whole CrowdStrike news? Was it a promise to do better in the future? Was it a call for better transparency about Windows applications? No, they're blaming the EU for requiring them to allow third-party programs to run at the kernel level. They're pointing all the way back to a 2009 agreement that forced Microsoft to allow third parties to run with the same permissions as Microsoft products, as opposed to a company like Apple, which regulates kernel access more strictly. There is a lot to unpack in this whole story, whether it's the CrowdStrike part or the Microsoft part, or even the fact that we recently found out that CrowdStrike didn't do any canary tests. They just ran this code through a validator. It said yes, and they pushed it out and said YOLO. Stephen, where do you want to start with this? Well, I guess first off, um, you know, I guess I picked the wrong week to not be on the rundown. Um, <laughs> no, it, it's funny. Um, you know, people are saying, you know, some, some years feel like weeks and some weeks feel like years. Um, well, this has been a year. Um, yeah, CrowdStrike, uh, I was actually on vacation. I was affected by this uh, myself, um, which it was incredible to walk through the, air, uh, the, the, the terminal and see uh, blue screens all around me and see people lining up for, uh, you know, uh, boarding using iPads and uh, iPhones instead of uh, the regular terminals, all sorts of things like that was happening. I should mention that technically this is not a blue screen of death. It was a different blue screen, but come on people, who cares? Point is uh, the software update caused PCs to uh, halt and not work anymore, which, you know, 
to a layperson is uh, pretty much a BSOD. Um, the uh, the fixes uh, were simple, but as you point out, the problem, the underlying problem was that essentially CrowdStrike pushed this out without any kind of staging or testing or anything. They just ran it through their validator. The validator said yes. And within um, 90 seconds, I think, uh, the first customers were impacted by this. And within uh, an hour or so, it was rippling across the world in every industry, which just shows how uh, susceptible we are to damage. Um, I think my take, my initial take on this was, oh boy, um, as a, a Linux user and believer, uh, I see a bunch of people sort of dancing on the grave and saying, ha that's what you get for using Windows. Oh, no, no, no. This could have been us. This could have been any of us. The same kind of problem could theoretically have affected Linux machines, Macs, even the mainframe, because essentially we're all relying on service providers to do proper testing and validation of their software. And many of us blindly push those, those new updates into production especially when it comes to security. I think we should point out that the reason that CrowdStrike uh, continually pushes these uh, updates to all of their clients is because they are constantly fighting to keep those systems secure and they have to be pushing stuff out continually. Honestly, if you are waiting to apply uh, security updates or uh, vulnerability patches on critical infrastructure, until uh, a day, a week, a month after they're issued, uh, that's gonna be a serious security issue. In other words, we all have to trust companies like Cloud, CrowdStrike to do the right thing in, for our systems. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, they didn't. Now, there's a whole bunch of things to unpack, but Tom, I, I know you talked about this last week. Um, am I off base here in saying that this was kind of inevitable and we really do have to trust companies like CrowdStrike? Oh, you're absolutely not wrong on that at all, Stephen. One of the things that we've seen over the years is that the more insidious that malware writers get, the more creative we have to be on the ways to combat them. I mean, if you remember back to the Kaseya hack that happened, what, a couple of years ago, uh, they were literally using Microsoft Defender to deploy their malware. Like that was like that. That was the kind of ingenious, malicious part of it was that they were literally using the anti malware system of Windows to do the the work for them. So you know, CrowdStrike works because it runs at the kernel level. Like it is able to examine files and halt the system from booting if it's infected. You want that? Like that is a big deal. And the problem, of course, is that what happens when that system gets compromised. Going back to Kaseya, what happens when your software delivery system is the thing that's compromised, not the user land applications? Well, you just basically keep getting malware delivered to you over and over again. And I mean, the number of systems that were impacted. So we use Macs here at, at the rundown. So I wasn't affected. I could wake up on Friday morning and boot my system just fine. But applications that I use, maybe weren't working because they require a Windows backend authentication or they were running on Azure, which kind of had its own problems. But the thing that people need to understand is that it was all interconnected. Like, for example, here's a fun one that I literally found out about yesterday by listening to NPR, where our good friend Tim Crawford was interviewed uh, on All Things Considered. Uh, major airlines recovered relatively quickly for airlines, which means it still took a few hours for them to get back up and running, except for Delta. Delta took a lot longer to come back online. In fact, as of yesterday, they were still canceling a ton of flights. And one of the reasons why was, believe it or not, because it sounds like Delta was more security conscious than other companies, which means that they enabled BitLocker encryption on all of their PCs but BitLocker makes it harder to boot into safe mode to protect your data because it encrypts the whole hard disk. So rather than just rebooting and tapping F8 to get into safe mode, you actually have to provide a code to get into a BitLocker encrypted uh, volume in safe mode, which means recovery times were longer. Now, of course, we saw the joke that Southwest Airlines was in, not impacted because, and I kid you not, their system still runs on Windows 3.1, uh, 3.1 for life, baby. But I, I don't, 
understand how people can take a look at this and say, oh, ha ha, I run Linux, so this isn't my problem. I got news for you folks. CrowdStrike does make a Linux application and Linux systems running CrowdStrike were affected. So this is a bigger problem. And it speaks a lot to software development, not just to the way that, that companies consume it. Because like you said, CrowdStrike did not test this. And given the fact that the person who's at the helm of CrowdStrike right now was tangentially responsible for an outage 15 years ago, it has a lot of people asking questions about how software development is done and this idea that we have to push, push, push because we have to show value so that companies will continue to use our subscription services as opposed to taking the time, slowing it down, making sure that this is right so that we don't have issues. If this had been CrowdStrike deploying a uh, an emergency patch because there was a massive zero day that was found in their kernel, I would have totally been okay with the fact that, you know, we had to get this out to save some, but in order to save some, we had to knock some others offline. But this was just like a, a random Thursday night push. And even though we saw it starting to roll out, I mean, the register had coverage of this at like 2 a.m. US time. The fact that it rolled so quickly and we had no counter for it because it happened while we were asleep makes me wonder if we need a better solution because really, to me, it sounds like automation allows us to fail faster with bigger explosions. You know, another thing, Tom, I want to get to is what you mentioned about the EU. Um, so there was a lot of talk about micro, from Microsoft about how it, this, might, this wouldn't have happened if they had not been restricted from by the EU and required to allow companies like CrowdStrike to use the kernel. As you point out, it is perhaps technically important for applications like CrowdStrike to run in or near the kernel level. I think that it's possible that Microsoft could have come up with an abstraction that would have allowed companies not to have a kernel mode um, process for this sort of technology. In fact, that's what Apple has been doing with Mac OS quite a lot. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the latest versions of Mac OS have eliminated uh, kernel extensions and third-party software running in the kernel. They've also done a lot to harden the operating system, uh, to cryptographically secure the operating system to make sure that there's no malware touching it. Now, that doesn't make Mac OS inherently secure, but it does make it less susceptible to issues and errors like this. So Microsoft uh, was claiming, and I feel like this was kind of a disingenuous thing. They were claiming that this is really the EU's fault. See, if only you had allowed us to block things from the kernel, none of this would have happened. Well, as you pointed out, um, that's not entirely true because the case that they're pointing to was a case where they were going to use Microsoft Defender in the kernel and force all competing products out of the kernel. So that would have given Defender an unfair advantage in the security market. And frankly, as you point out, uh, Windows Defender is not without flaw and not without issues like this happening to it. So sure, would it have prevented this CrowdStrike uh, error from uh, blue screening all these uh, PCs around the world? Yeah. Would it have prevented anything like this ever possibly from happening? Heck no. This sort of thing could happen a lot. We talked about this actually yesterday. I was a guest on the TechStrong Gang. You'll see me most Tuesdays on the TechStrong Gang at TechStrong TV. And we talked about this in detail, but um, I really don't feel that this is an appropriate line of uh, conversation or defense for Microsoft. The fact that the EU blocked uh, them from blocking third parties from the kernel is technically related but that's not the cause of this issue. And using an issue like this in, as, as a way to try to push back on laws and regulations like the EU's is really, frankly, kind of cynical. Um, it really isn't, it doesn't hold water from a technical perspective. It doesn't hold a lot water from a legal perspective. Frankly, it just looks like a lot more, he said, oh no, look over there, it wasn't our problem. Um, when honestly, what Microsoft could have said frankly, was this wasn't our problem. CrowdStrike didn't test their thing. They pushed a bad update and it crashed our systems. Sorry, that's just how it is. Um, I'm not pointing a lot of fingers at Microsoft here because in this particular case, I don't feel like they are the ones at fault, which means that I don't think the EU is really the one at fault here either. 
I completely agree. And I'll go a step further. It's not just cynical of Microsoft. It's absolutely hypocritical. You know why? Because they would absolutely allow their software to run at ring zero if they could get away with it. Do you remember back in the 90s when they had a whole lot of undocumented function calls that were happening in win.any in Windows 3.1 that allowed Microsoft Word to load faster than Word Perfect? That almost got their entire organization broken up under an antitrust ruling. And it was only by, you know, divine intervention at the last minute that that didn't happen and allowed Microsoft to grow to the point that it is today. Do you know why Apple is able to get away with having severe restrictions on the way their kernel operates? Because Apple's software has to follow the same restrictions. That's the difference. The EU is not blocking you from doing this because it's only right that everybody gets to run at ring zero. The EU is saying that your applications and the third party applications need to have the same privileges. So if you will let Defender run in ring one or wherever it needs to run so that it doesn't crash the kernel, then I bet you, you can get CrowdStrike out of your kernel too. So stop talking out of both sides of your mouth and let's not ignore the fact that you guys had an outage before this ever started. If it hadn't have been for CrowdStrike, you would have been the top story this week because a Microsoft Azure outage is always a big deal. It just so happened that your few thousand systems that went offline for a little bit first thing in the morning, which let's be fair, were probably a harbinger of the actual CrowdStrike deployment, although we're not entirely sure because doing the DFIR on that thing is going to be a nightmare for months to come. You dodged a bullet. And like Steven said, you should have stood up and said, Terrible things happen. We did this in the name of security. It's not an operational problem with Windows. Trying to pass the buck makes you look about as bad as the CrowdStrike CEO right now. Everybody needs to do better. Everybody needs to wash their hands and take a long, hard look at the way that we do this stuff. And I do want to make a special shout out to the person who left a really stupid comment on Satya Nadella's LinkedIn update all about this, where he's talking about the fact that this is a violation of zero trust. You're as much a problem as the rest of us because you don't understand what zero trust actually does. Zero trust has nothing to do with kernel execution and things like that. Zero trust as we know it is a way that users interact with applications and least privilege and things like that. Once you get inside of ring zero, it doesn't matter anymore. There's no trust boundaries. Everybody's sitting at the same table doing the same stuff. It's on the developers to make sure that they write the correct code that won't crash things. And it's up to the operating system developers to pull up their big boy pants and decide that they're going to have to change the way that they operate their operating systems to prevent this from happening in the future instead of blaming everybody else for problems that, quite honestly, they're perfectly capable of solving. All right, now I'm going to get off my soapbox. So, okay, Tom, uh, you, you can, uh, I know this is a, a particular soapbox for you. I, one last thing that I would like to point out too is um, this was not a security issue. This was a stability issue. I've seen a lot of people because CrowdStrike is in the security space uh, automatically make the jump and call this a cybersecurity incident. It was not a cybersecurity incident. In fact, the fact that CrowdStrike is pushing out updates prevents cybersecurity incidents. Um, and this probably didn't expose these systems to any additional cybersecurity threats. Um, in fact, again, once the uh, proper update was applied, it protected those systems from threats. So there again, I think that it's important to recognize uh, that while a massive outage that caused uh, global uh, calamity for uh, multiple industries is a really bad thing, uh, running systems without malware protection is a far worse thing. <laughs> Steven, now that we've gotten all the systems back online and planes are back in the air, we've got a lot of stuff coming up in the weeks ahead, and you're going to be a very busy man. So why don't you tell us some of the things that you've got going on? Sure. Um, I'm headed in a couple of weeks to the SHARE conference in Kansas City. This is the uh, longest running IT conference. Uh, it has been running since the 70s when people literally shared tapes of, um, of software with each other across the table. Uh, it's mainframe focused. Uh, we've got some really cool stuff happening. Did you know that uh, software as a service and DevOps and AI and th that this is uh, all active in the mainframe space? Well, keep an eye on this space. We've already announced that pop-up mainframe 
uh, mainframe on demand, no kidding, uh, is going to be presenting. Uh, we're also about to make a couple more announcements of uh, presenters there. And the cool thing, too, is that we're having a, a combination of mainframe experts and uh, modern software uh, experts coming to this event as delegates. So sitting across the table from each other or next to each other are going to be some of the leading voices in the mainframe space and some of the leading voices in Kubernetes, in security, in AI. It's going to be a load of fun. So check out TechStrong TV for the live stream of that and uh, the YouTube channel uh, afterward for our uh, video uh, recordings. Now, we're also looking forward to AI Field Day. Um, we've got a few companies uh, already announced, but there is a, a dam about to burst on uh, company announcements there. We've got some very big companies joining us for AI Field Day, some very big names, uh, as well as some really key um, AI development platforms. That's going to be September 11th through 12th, or maybe 13th, given the number of uh, companies that have uh, indicated that they want to join us. We're also going to be at Edge Field Day. We're going to be making an announcement in, in, in another day here about another Edge Field Day company that's going to be there um, already. We've got a variety of different uh, platforms and technologies joining us there. Um, we also are going to be doing an AI data infrastructure field day. That's right, a, 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 an event focused on the infrastructure for data underneath AI models. Uh, that's October 2nd and 3rd. And we've got a lot more Tech Field Day events, including some that are going to have Tom involved in them uh, later in the year. So make sure you stay tuned to techfieldday.com to check out that schedule because you're going to want to mark your calendars for all the great stuff we have coming up this fall. Hopefully, you already have your calendar marked for Wednesdays at around 1230 Eastern Time because that's when we come out with the weekly episode of The Rundown. Whether you're watching this on our YouTube channel, you're checking out the show notes on gestaltit.com, or you subscribe to us in your favorite podcast application so you can check out the news while you're going on your daily walk or, you know, mowing the yard, whatever it is. We are very glad to have you here and we're, we love keeping you up to date on all the things that are going on. Um, make sure that you catch us, as Stephen mentioned, on TechStrong Gang on Tuesday, as well as other future and group programs, because we're all over the place um, commenting on what's going on, making sure that you guys are aware of all the latest trends in the space. We will be back next week with another great episode with more news of all the things that happened. Um, thankfully, Starbucks order online is uh, back up and running, so we'll have caffeine. But until then, for myself, Tom Hollingsworth, for Stephen Foskett, and all of our great people, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week on The Rundown.